Good afternoon, Black Health Matters family. Are you all enjoying the summit? I hope that you are. Please, please go to our exhibit hall. We've got lots of experts that want to talk with you. Um, again, they can show you videos, they can show you chat, they can have a chat with you. You can download literature. So it's well worth the investment of your time. Please go to our exhibit hall and check out our partners. Now we're gonna talk about one of my most favorite topics and I guess one of my most favorite muscles in the body. I'll have to ask Dr. Fergus if it's a muscle. <laughs> but we're gonna talk about the heart. When you think about it, the heart has to work for the entire time that you are breathing. When you're sleeping, your heart is working. When you're walking, your heart is working. It's a muscle that just will not stop. You don't want it to stop. So how do we treat, treat it? How do we take care of it for the long haul? And just let me just share a quick stat. Nearly 48% of African-American women and 44% of African-American men have some form of heart disease. And I get it because the heart is always working. So, you know, our diet, how we live, our stress, all impact this very, very important muscle. So research has found that even among growing middle and upper class African-Americans, heart rate, heart disease is still extremely common. So no matter what your socioeconomic factor is, we need to take care of our heart. So today we put together an esteemed panel of experts to talk about heart disease, advocacy, and policy. I want to introduce first Dr. Isilma Fergus, otherwise known as Dr. Icy. She's an Associate Professor of Medicine and Director of Cardiovascular Disparities at Mount Sinai Medical Center. She is also a past president of the Association of Black Cardiologists. I also want to introduce you to C. Virginia Fields. She's the president of the National Black Leadership Commission on Health. She's a veteran civil rights act activist leader, educator, and philanthropist. Ms. Fields serves as a featured speaker on leadership issues, on health, government, and at various events that support industry relating to health and policy. And I'm pleased to say that Dr. Fergus and Ms. Fields, we are all members of Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem with the minister, Reverend Calvin O. Butt. So now I'd like to introduce you to our specialist. Thank you. Thank you. So C. Virginia, you were going to go first. Okay, thank you. And this is a pleasure to join all of you and a shout out for just doing this. Let me begin by saying that and clearly these are extraordinary times in which we are living. COVID-19, social unrest, Spread of the virus has also illuminated for the world to see the disparities, racial disparities here in the United States. People are dying, people are fearful, people are afraid, people are angry, and the history of health disparities are well documented, uh, irrefuted, and out there for everyone to see. So I want to commend uh, our hosts today, Black Health Matters, in terms of bringing us together for this important conference, as well as continuing your leadership on the issues and work to make sure that our voices are elevated throughout this time and further. And we at the National Black Leadership Commission on Health are proud to be a partner with you in coordinating and collective ways to make changes, especially in the areas of health. So briefly, let me just make a few words about the National Black Leadership Commission on Health. Our commission is really about championing the promotion and the prevention of diseases to reduce disparities and achieve equity within the Black community. We envision a society in which the disparities are significantly reduced. We love to see them eliminated, but certainly significantly reduced, and that we can achieve equity 
to promote the health and well-being of African Americans through advocacy, policy, and actions. This organization was founded in 1987 and is the oldest organization in the country that has actually been focused on educating, empowering Black leaders to meet the challenges of fighting HIV AIDS. And now, having evolved to a more comprehensive advocacy policy and action organization, we rebranded in last year, 2019, and that brought about a new name, the National Black Leadership Commission on Health, a new mission, a new vision, and an expanded focus on health issues that uh, disproportionately impact African Americans. And all of these are interrelated even with HIV AIDS. And the areas in which we are now focused continues to be HIV AIDS, hepatitis C, cardiovascular disease, prostate cancer, breast cancer, sickle cell, diabetes, and mental health. Because we know that HIV does not stand alone. And because of the impact disproportionately in African Americans, this has allowed us to continue our work with a broad spectrum of local state leaders, uh, faith-based organizations, and various other stakeholders where we achieve our mission through community mobilization, leadership training development, advocacy, and policy. So we are delighted to be a partner with uh, the organization in moving these issues forward. And this portion of the presentation and discussion, as Rosalind said, is something important to all of us. We want our heart to act right, be in the right place, help us to function and to continue the work that we are doing. And so this will this portion will address one of the organization's health focus areas and that's cardiovascular disease. Its impact on the black community. How can we as black people think about risk in this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, and with African Americans known to have, uh, have the highest rates, not only of hospitalizations, but of deaths related to COVID-19. What does that mean? How do we think about the risk? And now that there's talk about a vaccine, uh, hopefully we can uh, share more information about what does this mean to the Black community, given our fears around clinical trials. So as we begin this discussion, we invite you to post questions or comments in the chat box. And following the presentation, we will go and have responses to those questions. So to make the presentation is Dr. Isima Fergus. She is an MD with over 28 years of experience in the medical field, board certified in internal medicine and cardiology, an associate professor, a specialist at Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai Hospital, New York City. She is the founder and director of Healthy Heart Series and she is the author of numerous articles related to heart disease and congestive heart failure. She's a leading voice that is often sought out as a presenter and a speaker on matters of cardiovascular disease. And as Roslyn said, we share a number of things together. And I'm pleased to say we also share uh, members of the same sorority, Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority, shout out to AKA today, <laughs> and the links. With that having been said, Dr. Fergus, please. Thank you, C. Virginia Soros, C. Virginia Link Sister, C. Virginia 
for that very, very, very generous introduction. Uh, before I jump into my presentation, I would like to commend and congratulate our link sister, Rosalind Daniels, for the inaugural virtual summit of Black Health Matters, which is just phenomenal so far from what I'm seeing. And the topics are truly amazing. Um, as you eloquently discussed already, heart disease is the leading cause of death, but now we have COVID coming up as the third leading cause of death. So I thought that I would present it a little bit differently by laying the framework a little bit about heart disease, but then leading into how heart disease uh, and COVID sort of interact. Uh, so with that in mind, see Virginia, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen if you don't mind. Please and uh, then I will just go through a few slides and then uh, we welcome, as uh, said before, your questions. So I'm going to go ahead and share my slides. Um, so here's my screen. Okay, so we're talking about heart disease. And of course, um, this year, things are a little different because we're dealing with this COVID pandemic. So where are we and what can we do? Um, okay, if I could go through the next slide. Okay, so I just wanted to share some stats. Um, the leading cause of death in the United States, and in fact, in the world, is from heart disease. Every minute in the United States, someone dies from heart disease, stroke, or some other form of cardiovascular disease. In fact, you can liken it to a jetliner crashing every few minutes with about 250 people on board. So as you can see, that's an alarming statistic and something to be taken into consideration. The young and women are not immune. People typically think because they're young, they cannot get heart disease. Um, and women, um, because they have, they're protected by estrogens, um, there are some women who still think that heart disease is not the leading cause of death and that they're not affected. But uh, important to recognize that heart disease does not discriminate and can affect everyone. So I'm just gonna go through these, these bullet points and then we'll discuss some more. The other thing that I wanted to point out is that although heart disease death rates have declined steadily over the last 25 years, rates among black and women have fallen at a slower rate. I will show that to you. And we do know that certain communities, people are less likely to receive cardiovascular testing and appropriate treatment, especially within certain groups. Uh, we can talk about that but I have good news, see Virginia, and also some concerning news. The good news is that heart disease is 80% preventable. Okay, so there are a lot of things you could do to um, manage your heart disease. The bad news is that COVID is now the third leading cause of death in the United States and can affect the heart. So let's just look at the, uh, what we typically look at as far as um, the leading cause of death until this year, 2020. And this is data from circulation. So you could see that um, the leading causes, the four leading causes or most common cause of death are uh, actually here on the screen with CHD is uh, coronary heart disease or cardiovascular disease, followed by stroke, lung cancer, and breast cancer. So this slide is saying two things. Um, it's telling us these are the leading causes of death, but it's also showing us which groups. And I picked females because um, you know I wanted to punctuate that this is an issue that women um, have to deal with, but it's similar for men. So if you could see in blue is whites, um, a lower bar compared with black females in the red um, and Hispanic females in the green. So if you look at both heart disease and stroke and now breast cancer, you'll see that uh, you know, black women or blacks are more likely to uh, have uh, that as the most common cause of death. So um, I submit to you that all chronic, um, conditions um, have, have been, de were decreasing prior to this year. Um, heart disease was down 68%, uh, stroke down 79%, and cancer had been coming down. But if you look at this slide here to the right, um, this shows a, like a sort of um, decline in death rates, but um, you could see that uh, blacks and um, uh, blacks, both women and men are lagging behind. So the top bar shows the black male with the highest rate of uh, cardiovascular death, um, and then the white male. 
Um, so you see a, 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 that, that black males are less likely um, to uh, improve in terms of outcomes for heart disease. And the same with uh, white women and black women, you see that um, the black women are less, has a, a less steep decline for heart disease. What does this mean? There's a decline, as you see in the solid bars and the dotted bars, but the dotted bars remain above the, um, the solid bars. So that means that black women and black men have a slower rate of decline in heart disease compared with white men and white women. And why should that happen? Um, in this country where we have all of the resources. Uh, so that's something to be discussed. So why are African-Americans um, affected the most? There are risk factors, um, of course, some cardinal ones that you're aware of, and I'll focus on one or two. So hypertension, diabetes, obesity, cholesterol, family disease. Um, but I submit to you that there are many uh, other contributors, what we call the social determinants of health, um, that basically uh, contribute to uh, the maintenance and the ongoing disparities uh, in terms of heart, heart disease. Uh, so you're talking about where you live, where, how much money you work, what access you have to healthcare, uh, beliefs, um, you know, systemic issues, both at the local level, um, the hospital or institution level, and at the governmental levels, which we're seeing a lot more uh, social inequities in these days, but a lot of these have really contributed to the fact that people are not even getting the information early on enough and being having access or preventable care to really uh, eradicate and reduce um, cardiovascular disease. So there's a lot of it that has to do with the social determinants of health. Unfortunately, I can't delve into all of that in this uh, you know, topic uh, today because we don't have a lot of time, but I put that out there for you to you know, review. And at the end, we talk about some ways in which we can uh, get the information out. Um, but we do have to focus on some of the risk factors because we said it's 80% um, preventable and some of the things we could do for ourselves. So I like to put this slide up here that says, it's not that diabetes, heart disease, and obesity runs in your family, it's that no one runs in your family. And that is a little joke, but uh, some of the, as I said, some of the risk factors are manageable, um, but a lot of our um, you know, individuals within the black and brown communities uh, sometimes don't pay enough attention to certain things that they can improve for themselves uh, for many of the social reasons we talked about. And so, um, if you look at simply just physical activity and um, being overweight, we do know that um, on average, if you exercise at least 30 minutes on most days of the week, it reduces cardiovascular disease. We also know that obesity increases your risk for heart disease. In fact, um, a particular type of obesity, which is truncal obesity of visceral fat, fat around the middle. So if you're apple-shaped versus pear-shaped, it's more likely to lead to heart disease. So this slide shows right in the middle, black women uh, have the highest rates of obesity, 58.5% for women over 20 years, and the lowest rate of physical activity, shown here, black females. And then you see the other groups, white females, black, uh, white males, black males, Hispanic females, Hispanic uh, males. So again, lowest rate of exercise and, and highest rate of um, uh, obesity. So I want to focus on um, hypertension because that is one of the lowest hanging fruits in terms of things that we could do within the United States to protect against heart disease, okay? Um, hypertension or high blood pressure can cause many things. It can cause the heart to be enlarged and cause uh, major issues with heart disease. And many of you are now aware when they looked at some of the patients with coronavirus in China and in other places in the United States, having these underlying conditions such as hypertension was a big issue. Uh, in Wuhan, in fact, 70% of those who um, uh, had gross anatomy and they looked through were patients who had hypertension. So again, um, I just wanted to focus a little bit on this. Now, if you look at the groups, white males, white females, black males, black females, and Hispanics, and you follow them from the early 1980s all the way up to the 2000s, you'll see right in the middle, black male and black female uh, above everybody else. We have the highest rates of hypertension and um, that continues. In fact, the rates of hypertension, the percentage of the population is increasing over time. 
um, even more so in the black females and black males. And as we know, hypertension is manageable. Um, is it, what, what, why do you think would be some of the reasons um, for this hypertension being so high? Now, this next slide, um, you know, it actually shows that um, awareness, treatment and control. And it shows that if you look, it's a little bit of a complicated slide, but it's basically showing uh, white, black, Hispanic, and Asian, the total population in the United States, and talks about awareness. So if you look on this left set of bars where it says awareness, um, you'll see the green bar um, and the red bar next to each other shows that blacks and whites are equally aware. If in fact, blacks are a little bit more aware of the issues of related to hypertension. But when you look at control or treatment, um, you see that um, whites um, are about 80%, 77.9% control, whereas blacks are less control, 75.8%. Uh, on to in terms of treatment, all right? So more whites are on treatment compared with blacks. Blacks tend to need more um, treatments or more medications uh, compared with whites, um, like two or three blood pressure meds compared with one. Uh, but when you look at control over here to the right, uh, you see that more, nobody is well controlled in general, but more whites in the red bar are controlled compared with uh, the other groups and black again being in the green bar. Here in the upper right, you see one of my programs with one of the patients getting their blood pressure checked. Um, this is something being done in the community. So um, the other risk factors are underlying conditions which actually contribute to COVID. I'm not, I don't have enough time to go into them, but uh, we're talking about some of the things I mentioned before, such as um, we talked about obesity, we talked about hypertension, but there's also diabetes, cholesterol, chronic lung diseases, and uh, kidney diseases. Um, again, those are more likely to be higher in blacks, but we can't discuss that in, in, this, con in this conversation. I do want to focus on other risk factors because this is up and coming and a major uh, contributor that a lot of people are overlooking now because there's so many other things going on. But with COVID, we're seeing a lot of emotional components, stress, anxiety, depression, um, and it could be a secret uh, killer because it causes an inflammation, an inflammatory process that can lead to heart disease. And in fact, um, a couple of recent studies are now showing that people have so-called broken heart syndrome, or the term is Takotsubo's cardiomyopathy, uh, where uh, the heart uh, becomes dysfunctional. Um, and it's not because you have an underlying uh, blockage or other thing, but could be caused by significant stress, anxiety, depression, emotional components that causes the heart to give out. And it may look on an EKG as if you're having a heart attack, but also um, that you're having heart failure. So we're seeing you know, some of these uh, cases of broken heart syndrome. The good news is that in many cases, after the stress has gone and people get on treatment, you've done a diagnostic cath, you'll see that it can recover. So um, this uh, next slide, again, shows you that um, these different mental states and your heart um, are related uh, because of abnormalities of the inflammatory response secondary to the autonomic nervous system. So you've heard of the sympathetic and parasympathetic system, as well as catecholamines. Those are substances which increase your blood pressure and your heart rate and causes an inflammatory response. And with this, of course, it, then it leads to issues relating to heart disease, heart failure, and strokes. And um, actually, you can see um, depression among stroke survivors, um, among uh, people who with heart failure, uh, they're tremendously interrelated. And we do know that having high blood pressure and diabetes also lead to a greater cognitive decline. Now, I was asked to talk about the, the symptoms, uh, cardiovascular disease symptoms, and how may they be different um, with women, within them, and among them. So the typical symptoms everybody knows is a heaviness on your chest, you put your hand over your chest, it's like an elephant sitting on your chest. Um, you may feel uh, it radiating down your left arm um, and that's called angina or angina, which is basically a you know, symptom of heart disease. With women, it may be different. Um, you may have flu-like symptoms, nausea, vomiting, cold sweats, stomach complaints, just fatigue and tiredness, tiredness anxiety, loss of appetite. So these kind of sound nonspecific, right? And the other thing that's important is that women, sometimes, especially in the black 
uh, communities, they are in denial, they're stoic because they're the matriarch or they have to look for the family, look out for the family, look out for their parents, look out for the children, look out for their churches, look out for their sororities, look out for their link organization and everything else. And so a lot of times sometimes deny their own selves. Now, there are other um, groups um, uh, of women who uh, they complain or they say things a lot and they spend a lot of time really talking about uh, issues. So um, either one of these groups of women, if they have a, a condition, they may not be treated or they may not show up to the emergency room or they may not be taken as seriously if they're an over complainer. So this is why you know uh, the symptoms among women are so important and it's important to recognize if you see this in one of your sisters, your friends, your colleagues or sorrows or whatever, um, you know, try to bring it to their attention to let them know that something is not right and you yourself should know something is not right. I just wanna focus a bit on cardiac testing. These are some of the tests that we do in, um, to diagnose um, what's going on um, with someone. So if you have any of those symptoms, uh, one of the first things that your doctor should do is an EKG that is shown here on the left. And the EKG just gives 13 seconds of information, um, but it tells you right away a couple of things. One, if you look like you've had heart damage, um, what your heart rate is. If you have what's called an arrhythmia or irregular heartbeat, you'll see that. Um, depending on if you're short of breath, you could do a, a chest X-ray, and here is a chest X-ray with a very large heart. Based on these, and particularly if you have some of the risk factors we talked about, hypertension, diabetes, cholesterol, et cetera, they should be referring you for a stress test. And here you see someone walking on a treadmill and or an echocardiogram, which shows how your heart functions. This is a cardiac catheterization. Historically, blacks were not um, referred for multiple tests. And in fact, some of the um, you know, sit, you know, localized uh, centers, even some of the city hospitals here um, in, um, in New York City um, do not have a cath lab. So patients have to be referred out. Here on your left, this is what a cath picture looks like, um, showing the left coronary artery and the right coronary artery. On the right, I showed a schematic that shows why heart disease could be underdiagnosed in women. Um, on the top in A, um, you could see that there's a discrete blockage right here, which typically when you go into the cath lab, this could be opened up with a stent and the person's fixed. And that's typically seen more in males um, and in people who don't have things like diabetes, et cetera. But in women, um, especially black women and those with um, say diabetes, for instance, they just have a very tiny, um, uh, you know, if you will, lumen, we call it, um, to the vessel all the way through. So it's very tiny, blood is not getting through. There's a lot of um, disease outside, but you don't see one single blockage. So these people may be misconstrued and not treated in saying that there's not a blockage, but if you did a flow wire in the top, you see a seed chop out or up here. So there's a blockage here. If you did a flow wire on the bottom, you will see that the pressure continues to drop off over time. So what happens is the organs not being perfused it, at the same way it's not being perfused in A, it's not being perfused in B because you basically have a very long, narrow um, you know, connection where the blood and oxygen is not getting through. So quickly, because I wanted to um, quickly look at my time, uh, COVID, why is it so dangerous? It affects all of the organs and it affects the heart. Um, I don't have a lot of time, I'm gonna quickly go through that COVID uh, is much more contagious, two to three times more contagious than the flu. It lasts two to 14 days compared to one to four days. And um, most likely 19% compared with 2% guests get hospitalized and about three up to 3.4% of the group would die uh, compared with uh, flu. Um, so how does um, COVID affect the heart? It can cause a heart attack by causing clots um, to either form in place or be thrown. That's throm thrombo thrombosis or embolic, embolic phenomena. You can have an irritation of the heart muscle or you can have heart failure or an irregular heartbeat. I don't think we have a lot of time left. Um, emergency symptoms that are related to your heart and COVID, trouble breathing, chest pain, um, new confusion, um, ir irregular heartbeat, um, and these are some of the, the treatments that I can uh, send um, on to you because we don't have enough time to discuss it, but particularly now we're talking about blood thinners and um, uh, uh, steroids. 
And just in terms of the community, we have to keep our community together. We have to, you know, support our individuals, our partners, our, you know, participants, our community um, members uh, through the church, uh, through exercise here, people exercising. And here are a couple of resources that I have written through my program called Healthy Hearts uh, Series, a blood pressure book, diabetes book um, about coronavirus and a cookbook to provide for individuals. Um, and of course, health, faith, and community. So see Virginia, I'm gonna end here. I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna turn it back over to you um, and see if there are any questions that we can discuss. As a matter of fact, uh, well, first of all, thank you for the very informative and enlightening presentation. But I understand that we're going to have to answer the questions by our respondent in writing. Some of the questions like, for example, they want to know whether or not your slides will be made available. What is the correlation of stress to hypertension? Um, whether Native Americans fit in awareness, control, and treatment for hypertension? How true is it that people who survive COVID-19 may die from uh, arrhythmia because of medications they have been treated with? So uh, because of time, I'm told, we will not be able to answer the questions live, but those are the ones we've seen, and we will make sure that response are given to this. And the other one, of course, is that physical activity is so important, and how do we discuss this with Black women, particularly defending obesity as a cultural privilege? Right. Okay. So, I'm so we'll get... Answer. I'm trying to answer these questions, and I'll put the answers into the uh, chat box. Okay. Thank you so much, and thank all of you for this time. And I want to close by saying that we encourage you to complete the census because it's still being counted and we need to be counted because health care is directly impacted in terms of resources and access to health care in our community. So with that having been said, and thanks to Dr. Fergus for the You're very welcome. informative presentation and a reminder to vote in November uh, the dialogue will continue. Thank you. Thank and you. Continue to have a good day with the rest okay. of the conference. Okay, thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye.